name one Premier League team that did the best business. Who did the best business for you in the January window? Uh, it sounds like a broken record. I think it's Tottenham Hotspur. I really wow. do. I love the Kulisewski move. Uh, Conte is someone who's going to get the best out of his players when he believes in them. He got rid of that Ndombele distraction. Even if I want to see more of Ndombele, he is yeah. clearly contending for a top four spot. He's going to put Spurs back in the Champions League. He's just going to, he, he, he's doing everything he can to get them there. There is a vision of seeing out this season. And I think most of the pieces are pieces that could be a part of it going forward. Uh, so yeah. I, I really like what he's doing. Andy, what about you? One team stands out business-wise? Yeah, I, I have to agree with that right there. And I think it's also a matter of timing it, it is why as well. If the, the number of players, whether they've been able to move on them on permanently or on loan this month, and the money that will be saved will just be money added to the transfer fund for the summer coming up. And so that's going to give Conte a little bit more buying power in a market that's going to have a lot of players available. And I'm not just talking about with transfer fees, but there's going to be a lot of free agents this summer. We're starting to see players wind down their contracts a lot more. One, because they want a little bit more control and say over where they, you know, where their career goes and where they play. But two, uh, the, the financial ramifications of COVID have meant that a lot of players have not been re-signed to massive deals that they otherwise would have gotten because clubs don't have the money to pay those massive deals right now. And so we're going to see an influx of free agents. And I think that's one thing that we saw at Juventus when Partici was running the show there was he loves a free signing. He got some really good players to Juventus, built a number of title teams around free signings. And we're going to see a lot of that from Spurs this summer. And they're going to they're going to be one of the first teams in on every single player that's available because they will have the money uh, that, that one they've not had in the past because they were building the stadium. It seems like the financial situation due to that is in pretty good stead. Uh, but also, I think they're going to have more money than most other clubs out there. And so uh, they're in a strong position going forward. If they can get top four this season on top of that, have Champions League to offer Champions League money as well, look out. Yeah, look out indeed. Okay, who didn't do enough business? Is there one Premier League team you think, oh, they could have really elevated themselves, either saved themselves from the relegation or got into the top four if they would have done more business? I mean, I am looking at Arsenal a little bit. I think this is the opportunity for them. They've been closer than ever to getting into the top four, or not ever, but recently over the last few years. And I think if they did bring in a striker, if they did break the bank for that, then they probably would get over the line and they probably would give themselves an advantage considering they don't have European action or any cup action to worry about in the next few months or in the last few months of the season. Anybody disagree with that? I mean, I'm looking at down at the bottom, Newcastle, Burnley, Norwich, Watford, did those kind of teams, did they do enough business? Who wants it? Go at it. Yeah, I'll take it here real quick. Uh, and I'll throw it back to you, Joe. Did Saints do enough by bringing in Willie Caballero this month? That feels like a place that probably needed a signing or two just to solidify themselves away yeah. from the relegation battle, and, and they didn't do it. Yeah, you're right. I think the key for them was probably just maybe working some connections with Amanda Brozier and some of those ones to try and get them in permanently. But you're right. It's a little bit concerned. I think Leeds United is another team that obviously tried to sign Brendan Aronson and didn't go through. And yeah, there's a couple of teams there. I think will be looking nervously over their shoulders, even Brentford bringing in Christian Eriksen. He probably would, will help them just stay safe, but they've been on a bit of a slide as well. And you think defensively they could maybe have done with a few reinforcements, but yeah, there's a lot of teams down the bottom, I think, or maybe will regret even Burnley bringing in, uh, obviously, their course right at the end. That's what they needed to replace Chris Wood. But I feel like they could have maybe gone out and got a few more players as well. Um, West Ham, someone's bringing that up. Yeah, in that's terms an interesting comment. one. That's good, right? Nick, you go with that? Yeah, I think I look at them and, and again, so many of these teams did spend a lot in the, in the summer. I have a buddy who's a big Canary supporter and I had asked him, you know, in the middle of the season, well, what are they going to do in January? And he's like, Nick, they bought guys. They did business. They don't normally do uh, in the off season. So it's hard to find a team. I mean, Burnley never buys. So, uh, and you could argue that they only bought because Chris Wood went to Newcastle. So this is, uh, I think it's just going to be a fascinating. I'm excited for this, this run into the season, all the, all the spots are up for grab. There's a top four spot. Uh, Wolves are the kind of secret team here. They weren't using Traore a lot. They, they got some money for him to go back home. Uh, so I'll be interested to see Wolves, Brighton, these teams that tend to sign players that we don't hear about, but we know that they've got a good eye for it. If they get somebody who hits, Brighton gets somebody who hits, Palace 
uh, get somebody hits. I know they they made um, Mateta's loan uh, full time now, so it'll be interesting to see who's the surprise guy because there's always somebody. These crack staffs, the people who use analytics well, uh, that have managers. And again, you know how I feel about Good Graham Potter, uh, the next uh, Pep Guardiola. He's uh, he's a guy who I, I wonder did they find the right fit because some of these guys have they haven't proven it at a very high level but you look at their numbers and you think about the equivalent of a Pat Sandaka or these guys who are now taking a jump from Salzburg to the Premier without a stop in between um, if one of those guys hits you're in a different ballpark okay here's a question Craig Eaton says who's going to make the top four I mean do we change our mind based on deadline yeah. day or the January transfer window or who are you going with Nick Nope. Uh, one, two, three, four. Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Spurs. Wow. Andy, agree with that? Uh, I don't remember what I had before uh, deadline day, but I, I think that's where I'm at uh, after deadline day now. Just And for all the reasons that we just talked about, it feels like Spurs have targeted serious areas of weakness. A third or fourth attacker to go with what they've got up top in the established stars. Uh, a central midfielder who can progress the ball forward and not just sideways, I, I think is going to be really big for this team. And I think unlock a lot of possibilities under Conte. So uh, that they've just done the most to improve themselves when Manchester United and Arsenal, probably the two biggest competitors for it. They didn't do anything. That's so true. West Ham as well, throw them into the mix. I feel, yeah, I'm, uh, Chelsea, Man City, Liverpool, you know what? I'm going to say Man United. I, I don't know for wow. whatever reason. I feel like they just are not a good team to watch right now, but they are grinding out draws and, and wins under Ralf Rangnick, and they just have enough star power to get them over the line. I don't know. Something about it says it's going to be so tight between Tottenham, Arsenal, Man United, right, right up until the end of the window. Sorry, end of the, well, it is the end of the window. End of the season. <laughs> and I think... Um, I think it really is just going to come down to who can deliver in the big moments. I think Man United have more experienced players who've done that in the past, be it Bruno Fernandes, Cristiano Ronaldo, Rashford, even Jaden Sancho can come up with big moments. I, I just think that's going to happen. For, but great question, Craig. I mean, that's that's really got us thinking here and thinking about the ramifications of what's been a crazy January and a crazy deadline. Go ahead, Nick. No, I was going to say, if you were to tell me that Ronaldo wasn't going to be – the the guy for them and then occasionally yeah. not start you know we're gonna see sancho we're gonna see more of rashford uh, i mean i think rashford's gotten stick just because ronaldo's there like i don't know that he's really he was he's been hurt there i think there was covid with him as well um we haven't even seen the best of him yet and bruno fernandez maybe he's going to be recharged too um but i just don't again the, the ronaldo move just seems so backwards and i do have to say this we yeah. talked about we give Ole Gunnar Solskjaer a lot of grief but we talked about how likable he was i don't know if you guys saw the picture of him at his daughter made her debut for the manchester united women and he had a big smile on his face and i was like i like to see happy Ole. like i like that i feel Ole. good for him yeah. um it does feel like the vibes aren't exactly there right now no, it's a rebuilding process and no one really knows what's going on. Uh, I think with Ralph Rangnick in terms of how much influence he's going to have off the pitch when he goes into his consultancy role, but intriguing times, intriguing times. Okay, let's finish with this question from Immortal. Who's going to get relegated? I mean, what basing on the moves we've seen this month, are we changing our mind? Is is one team really elevated themselves? Because I, it's, I think it's a four-way battle, right, lads? Norwich, Watford, Burnley, Newcastle, and maybe... A Brentford or a Leeds can get dragged into it. But personally, I think Newcastle have elevated themselves uh, away from the relegation scrap. I think that they've done more business and better business, solid business compared to the other teams. And I would probably, I'm going to go first. I'd say Norwich, Watford and Burnley would be my three to go down. But I, I don't know what you guys think, if you agree with that. But I just think that, especially in those three teams, they could have done more in the window. And I think all three just, kind of said, you know what, we're not going to take a gamble. They're all kind of cautious clubs financially and weren't willing to, to risk going out and spending 20, 30 million on one player that's going to keep them up. Whereas Newcastle with their new owners, we know they can do that. And they've obviously done that and spent a lot of money. So Norwich, Watford and Burnley and my three are going down. What do we reckon, guys? Yeah, I'm in agreement there. And I don't know that there's 
I don't know that by the end of the season there's a relegation battle. I think it might be pretty straightforward that it's those three. And I've been on the train that says, well, Watford have too much high quality attacking talent to uh, to go down. And I still believe that if Ismail Asar can come back from injury and he can be very productive and he can you know kind of lead that team once again, I think they will put up a fight and maybe make it interesting. But I, I think right now, given the way that their season is trending, Emmanuel Dennis has fallen off. Uh, you know, quite a bit. Joshua King, without those other two around him, is not getting the goals either. There's there's a lot of questions to be asked for Watford now that I didn't think were there a couple of months ago. So I agree. I think it's those three, uh, Everton, or excuse me, Everton and and Newcastle. I think have done enough. Uh, whether we agree with the long term strategy uh, of some of those moves to remove themselves, I think even from the conversation, maybe a month from now, it might just be as simple as they've played three or four or five games. They've picked up two wins and a draw or two each, and they're suddenly 10 points clear of the bottom three, as is everybody else. You know, Leeds, Brentford maybe could fall in there, but uh, they would have to they would have to pick up, I think, about, what, eight or 10 points in the second half of the season to really, truly fall into that. And, and that's really, really shocking poor form for a couple of teams that we have evidence and proof from the past. They can be good. They can play in the Premier League. I'll tell you what. Can. Go ahead. I got a surprise for you. I will mix it up. I will mix it up. I think uh, Leeds is going to go down. I think Leeds will go down. Oh, I have seen Marcelo Bielsa uh, quit on teams before he started the job. He's a demanding (laughs) guy. And if he ends up out of the picture, um, will it be a situation where they don't know how to play any other way? I I need to know that Calvin Phillips is going to be back. And it seems like he's been going to be back for some time. I've seen Sar score at AFCON. He's getting back. Uh, Cornet, uh, Cornet, excuse me, at, at Burnley. So, yeah, Leeds. And then I've got the wild one that I don't think is going to happen because Newcastle's new ownership is not going to want to say they got it wrong on their first manager. But remember, if things start to go bad, remember <laughs> how badly they wanted a guy who is now on the market in Rafa Benitez. Remember that they were going to take over the club and he was staying for when the takeover happened. I just want to throw that into the ether. I do think there's a chance Newcastle finishes the season with Rafa Benitez in charge. Do you want that? I don't know. I'll tell you what. (laughs) I I was a big Eddie Howe fan for a long time. I have not been encouraged by Ryan Fraser playing over Uh, Miguel Almiron and Matt Ritchie getting extended run and Sean Longstaff being in this part of the pitch. So they've given him a lot of ammunition now. And if if it doesn't turn around within three or four weeks – I wouldn't be surprised if that money looks to Rafa Benitez. Wow. Intriguing times ahead. The January transfer window always does this, right? It throws up more pressure on managers, clubs, players to kick on in the second half of the season. And we all know it's not that easy. It's very complicated to buy players in this window. So let's put a nice bow on this window now. Let's focus on a couple of things to finish up with. I want to ask you guys, what was your favorite transfer of deadline day or or the January window? Andy, I'm going to come to you, mate. (sighs) <sighs> that's a tough one uh sentimentally christian erickson for for everything that it represents and, and having him back in the game and potentially returning to the field uh i think in terms of impact and what's going to be you know consequences in the premier league this season it's got to be one of the signings probably that spurs made because you know if if what Nick and I are feeling and, and if predicted comes true and they're the team that finishes top four, it's probably because either Bentoncourt or Kulishevsky um, have, have hit the ground running as soon as they landed in London and, and really given that team something that it's missing. The foundation is there for that Tottenham team. Antonio Conte has put that in place, one, very quickly, but two, before he brought in any of his own players, he found a way to take what was there. He found what was useful. He found what wasn't useful, put it into something. And it's been it's been functional. It's been operational. And now it has the potential, I think, uh, to be good and, and to start to realize some of the potential. So uh, a Spurs signing to be determined uh, based on who plays well during the second half of the season, I, I think, is the one that makes the most impact. Nick, what about you, mate? Favorite signing, favorite moment of the window? Uh, I like that Arsenal bought two MLS players uh, who saw that coming in Matt Turner and uh, Austin Trusty, who is, of course, going back on loan to Colorado. And Colorado, really an organization I kind of admire for what they, they did this last year. And so how will they deal with that? It'll be very interesting. At least they get to keep him. But yeah, look, you're, you're looking at me. I told you how much I like the Kulishevsky move. Um, I love love what uh, Joe's about Alvarez at Man City. But 
Uh, to me, it's got to be uh, Bruno Guimaraes. This is a player who is, again, the sort of signing that harkens back to 20, 25 years ago when Newcastle would bring in a Michael Owen, as ill-fated as it was, when bring, they would bring in Johan Kabay. And for 15 years, Newcastle fans got to watch the biggest pile of rumors of Deli Alley was identified by them early uh, by Chief Scout Graham, Scott, Graham Carr, and he never showed up. Um, Alexander Lacazette was identified early. They didn't pony up the money. It was all players like this would then go to other clubs and deliver. And you just got so sick of it. Virgil van Dyke, by the way, now imagine that. Just money-wise alone, if they get van Dyke and Lacazette, are we not thinking about them <laughs> building off of a Europa League season that was just 10 years ago but might as well be 100? So I think that signing is big. It's a statement of intent. Whether it comes off and they survive, I don't know. But they needed that, uh, much like who was Sancho this summer. Even though that's not working out, Man United needed to make that signing to show they were still a player. Yeah, and, and also a mention quickly, I don't know that an individual signing from Aston Villa will really factor into this conversation, but I think on the whole, just all of the signings together, every single one of them will have an impact on that team and fills a, a very specific and direct need within that squad. And I, I think they've just done really good business to make that team even better and, and, and stronger under Steven Gerrard. Yeah, that was going to be my one. I think Coutinho stands out for me. Always, but yeah, it, it's just a nice thing to see him back enjoying his football after so long being on loan and uh, by Munich and then not really taking his chances at Barcelona and injuries. But mm -hmm. Going back to what you said, Andy, Christian Eriksen, I don't think you can beat that for a feel-good story. Um, it's been rumoured for the last few weeks, and now it's happened on deadline day to see him when he comes back onto the pitch for the first time yeah. in the Premier League for Brentford. That's going to be a special moment, and that was a, a really special transfer. This has been really special, guys. Thanks so much for <laughs> joining me for this uh, lovely wrap-up of the January transfer window and deadline day. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. We've loved interacting please send them in again on future chats we're going to have and uh, all i can do is uh, direct you to pro soccer talk on nbc sports.com uh, in the coming hours and days we'll be breaking down all the moves i'll have transfer grades tomorrow up on the website about which teams did the best moves to give them a grade for all 20 clubs who did well who didn't do as well we've already broken that down quite a lot tonight but we're doing it even more I'm really looking forward to the second half now and the business end of the Premier League season. Yeah. So thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Thanks, lads, for joining me. And have a great rest of your evening, morning, night, wherever you're watching from. And we'll speak to you all very soon indeed. Thanks, guys. Take care. Hi there. I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.